I had any other announcements, so let's just get right into the text. It's a long one, so uh, strap in. <laughs> Chapter 3, Searching for Answers Back home in Chicago, I was soon working again as a waiter on the Michigan Central Railroad. As I had already mentioned, the first day of the bloody Chicago race riot, July 28, 1919, came while I was working on the Wolverine Run up through Michigan. When I arrived home from work that afternoon, the whole family greeted me emotionally. We were all there except for Otto. The disagreements I had, I had had with my father in the past were forgotten. Both my mother and my sister were weeping. Everyone was keyed up, keyed up and had been worrying about my safety in getting from the situation to the house. Following our brief reunion, I tore loose from the family to find out what was happening outside. I went to the regional armory at the 35th and Giles Avenue because I wanted to find some of my buddies from the regiment. The street, Old Forest Avenue, had recently been renamed in honor of Lieutenant Giles, a member of our outfit killed in France. I knew they would be planning an armed defense and I waited in to, and I wanted to get in on the action. I found them and they told me of their plans. It was rumored that Irishmen from west of Wentworth Avenue, dividing line, were planning to invade the ghetto that night, coming in across the tracks by the way of 51st Street. We planned a defensive action to meet them. It was not surprising that the defensive preparations were underway. There had been clashes before, and often with white youth in athletic clubs invaded the black community. These clubs were really racist gangs organized by city ward healers and precinct captains. One of the guys from the regiment took us to an apartment of a, of a friend. It had a good position overlooking 51st Street near State. Someone had brought a Browning submachine gun. He'd gotten it some time before, most likely from the regimental armory. We didn't ask where it had come from or the origin of the 1903 Springfield Rifles army issued that had appeared. We set to work mounting the submachine gun and set up a watch for the invaders. Fortunately for them, they never arrived, and we all returned home in the morning. The following day it rained, and the National Guard moved into the black community. So overt raids by whites did not overt raids by whites did not materialize. Ours were not the only group which used its recent army training for self-defense of the black community. We had heard rumors about other groups of veterans who had set up a similar ambush. On several occasions, groups of whites had driven a truck at breakneck speed up the South Street in the heart of the Black Ghetto, with six or seven men in the back firing indiscriminately at the people on the sidewalk. The Black veterans set up their ambush at 35th and State, waiting in a car with the engine running. When the whites on the truck came through, they pulled up in behind and opened with a machine gun. The truck crashed into a telephone pole at 39th Street. Most of the men in the trunk had been shot down, the others fled. Among them were several Chicago police officers, off duty, of course. I remember standing before Angel's Flat on 35th and Wabash, where the day before four blacks had been shot by police. It appeared that enraged blacks set fire to the building and were attacking some white police officers when the latter fired on them. Among with, among with other blacks that gloated over the mysterious killings of two black cops with a history of viciousness in the black community. They had been found dead in an alley between State and Wabash. Undoubtedly, they had been killed by blacks who had taken advantage of the confusion to settle old scores with the black enforcers of the white man's law. Bewilderment and shock struck the black community as well. I had seen blacks standing before the burned out buildings of their former homes trying to salvage whatever possible. Apparent on the on their faces was bewilderment and anger. The Chicago Rebellion of 1919 was pivotal in my life. Always I had had to ha I'd been hot-tempered and had never took any insults lying down. This is even more true after the war. I walked out of a number of jobs because of my refusal to take any crap from anyone. My experiences abroad in the army and at home with the police left me totally disillusioned about being able to find any solution to the racial problem through the help of the government. For I had seen the offi official agencies of the country were among the most racist and most dangerous to me and my people. I began to see that I had to fight. I had committed myself to struggle war against whatever it was that made racism possible. Racism, which erupted in, in the Chicago riots, and the bombings and terrorist attacks which preceded it, must be eliminated. 
My spirit was not unique. It was shared by many young blacks that, at that time. The returned veterans and other young militants were all fighting back. There was a lot to fight against. Racism reached a high, side in, high tide in the summer of 1919. This was the Red Summer, which involved 26 race riots across the country, red for the blood that ran in the streets. Chicago was the bloodiest. The Holocaust in Chicago was the worst race riot in the nation's post-war history. But the riots took place in, in such widely separate places as Longview, Texas, Charleston, South Carolina, Elaine, Arkansas, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Omaha, Nebraska. The flare-up of racial violence in Omaha, my old town, followed the Chicago riots by less than two months. It resulted in the lynching of Will Brown, a packing house worker, for an alleged assault on a white woman. When Omaha's mayor, Edward P. Smith, sought to intervene, he was seized by the mob. They were close to hanging the mayor from a trolley pole when police cut the rope and rushed him to a hospital, badly injured. The common underlying cause of the riots in most of the northern cities was the racial tension caused by the migration of tens of thousands of blacks into these centers and the competition for jobs, housing, and the facilities of the city. Rather than being at a temporary peak, this outbreak of racism was more, likely, more like the rising of a plateau. It never got any higher, but it never really went down, either. Riding in the middle of a race riot in Washington, D.C. that summer, the black the black poet Claude McKay caught the bitter and belligerent mood of many blacks. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain, then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us through dead. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one blow deal one death blow. What th what though before us lies the open grave, like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. War and the riots of the Red Summer of 1919 left me bitter and frustrated. I felt that I could never again adjust to the situation of black inequality. But how, could it, but how had it come about? Who was responsible? Chicago in the early 20s was an ideal place and the time for education of a black radical. As a result of the migration of blacks during World War I, Chicago area had come to have the largest consecration of black proletarians of the country. It was a major point of contact for those masses with the white labor movement and its advanced radical sector. In the 30s, it was to become the main testing ground for blacks and white labor unity. The city itself was the core of a vast urban industrial complex sprawling along southeast shores of Lake Michigan. The area included five Illinois counties and two in Indiana. The latter contained such industrial towns as East Chicago, Gary, and Hammond. The metro metropolitan area contains the greatest concentration of heavy industry in the country. By the second half of the 20th century, it had forged into the le lead of the steelmaking industry, surpassing the great Mono Monongahela Valley of Pittsburgh in the production of primary metals, including steel mill, refinery, and non-ferrous metals operations. This was the gigan gigantic U.S. Steel Corporation in Gary, the Inland Steel Company plant in East Chicago, and the U.S. Steel South Works. These are now the three largest steel works in the United States. The steel mills of Chicago area supply more than 14,000 manufacturing plants. Chicago at the time, and remains today, the world's largest railway center. It ranks first in the manufacturing of railroad equipment, including freight and passenger cars, pullmans, locomotives, and specialized rolling stock. The city itself, the core city itself, was, far, was most famous for its wholesale slaughter and meatpacking industry. Chicago was known as the meat capital of the world, or in Carl Sandburg's more homely terms, hog butcher for the nation. The city's colossal wealth was concentrated in the hands of a few men who comprised the industrial and commercial and financial oligarchy. Among these were such giants such as Judge Gary of the, U of the mighty U.S. Steel, Cyrus McCormick of International Harvester, and the Meat Packers, Philip D. Armour, Gus Gustavus Swift, and the Wilson Brothers, 
George Pullman of the Pullman Works, R- Rosenwald of Montgom- Gom- Montgomery Ward, General Wood of C- General Wood of Sears and Roebuck, the Merchant Prince Marshall Field, and Samuel Insull of the Utilities. Those were the real rulers. Ostensible political power rested in the notoriously corrupt, gangster-ridden county political machine headed by Mayor William Hale, Big Bill Thompson, who carried the traditional expo- who carried on the tradition exposed as early as 1903 by Lincoln Stevens in the book Shame of the Cities. The glitter and wealth of Chicago's Gold Coast was based on the most inhuman exploitation of the city's largely foreign-born working force. A scathing indictment of the horrible conditions in the Chicago meatpacking industry was contained in Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, published in 1910. It was inevitable that some of the wage slave would rebel, that Chicago should become the scene of some some of the nation's bloodiest battles in the struggle between labor and capital. The first of these clashes was the railroad strike of 1877, which erupted in pitched battles between the strikers and federal troops. Then 1886 came, the famous Haywood Haymarket Riot, which grew out of a strike for the eight-hour day at the McCormick Reaper plant. During a protest rally, a bomb was thrown which killed one policeman and injured six others. This led to the arrest of eight anarchist leaders. Four were hanged, one was commit- one committed suicide or-, or was murdered in his cell. The others were sentenced to life imprisonment. Obviously, being tried and executed simply because they were labor leaders. These innocent men became a cause célèbre of international labor. Thousands of visitors made yearly pilgrimages to the city, where monuments to the executed men were raised. Haymarket became a rallying word for the eight-hour day. The martyrs were memorialized by the designation of the 1st of May as International Labor Day. Several years later, the city was the scene of the Great Pullman Strike led by Eugene V. Debs and his radical but lily-white American Railway Union, which participated in a nationwide shutdown of railroads in 19, 1894. Again, the federal troops were called in, and armed clashes between workers and troops ensued. These battles were merely high points in the city's long history of labor radicalism. It was the nat- national center of the early anarcho-socialist movements. In 1905, the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, or Wobblies, was founded there. The IWW maintained its headquarters and edited its paper, Solidarity, there. In 1921, Chicago was to become the founding convention of the Workers' Communist Party, USA, which maintained its headquarters and the editorial office of the Daily Worker from f- there from 1923 to 1927. Blacks, however, played little to no role in the turbulent early history of Chicago labor movements. This was so simply because they were not part of the industrial labor force. Prior to the World War I, blacks were employed mainly in domestic or personal service occupations, untouched by labor organizations. They were not needed in industries where a seemingly endless tide of cheap European immigrant labor, Irish, Scot, English, Swedes, German, Poles, East Europeans, and Italians sufficed to fill the city's manpower needs. The only opportunity blacks had of entering basic industry was as strike breakers. Thus, in the early part of the century, blacks were brought in as strike breakers on two important occasions, the stockyard strikes of 1904 and the citywide, citywide Teamster strike in 1905. In the first instance, blacks were discharged as soon as the strike was broken. After the Teamster strike, a relatively large number of blacks remained. As a result of the defeat of 1904, of the 1904 strike, the packing houses remained virtually unorganized for 13 more years, and the animosities which developed toward the black strike bakers became part of the racial tensions of the city. At the outbreak of World War I, the situation with respect to Chicago's black labor underwent a basic change. Now blacks were needed to fill the labor vacuum caused by the war boom and the quotas on foreign immigration. Chicago's employers turned to the south to the vast, untapped reservoir of black labor, eager to escape its conditions of plantation serfdom. Exacerbated by the cotton crisis, the the bull weevil plague, and the wave of lynchings, the great migrations began and continued in successive waves through the 60s. During the war, the occupational status of blacks thus shifted from largely personal service to basic industry. In the tens of thousands, blacks flocked to the stockyards and the steel mills, During the war, the black population went from 50,000 to 100,000. Successive waves of black migration were to bring the black population to over a million within the next 50 years. 
Black labor getting its first hold in the city and basic industry during the war had now become an integral part of Chicago's industrial labor force. With the tapping of the vast reservoir of cheap, unskilled labor, there were no longer any need for the peasantry of Eastern and Southern Europe. There was, however, a difference between the position of blacks and that of the European immigrants. The latter, after a generation or two, could rise, higher, rise to a higher skilled and better paying jobs, to administrative and even managerial positions. They were able to leave the ethnic enclaves and disperse through the city to become assimilated into the national melting pot. The blacks, to the contrary, found themselves permanently relegated to a second-class status in the labor force, with a large group outside as permanent surplus labor pool, to be replenished when necessary from the in inexhaustible reservoir of black, poverty-ridden, and land-starved peasantry of the South. The employers now had in hand a new source of cheap labor, with the victims of racist prescription to use it as a weapon against the workers' movement. Indeed, this went hand in hand with the Jim Crow policies of the trade union leaders, who had been largely responsible for keeping blacks out of basic industry in the first place. These large bureaucrats premised their racist racism on a doctrine of a natural black inferiority. The theory of an instinctive animosity between the races was a powerful instrument for an anti-union, anti-working class, divide and rule policy. The use of racial differences was found to be a much more effective dividing instrument than the use of cultural and language differences between the various white ethnic groups and the native born. As we know, ethnic conflicts proved transient as various European nationalities became assimilated, assimilated into the general population. Blacks, on the other hand, remain to this day permanently unassimilable under the present system. Such were the conditions in the day when I undertook my search for answers to the questions of black liberation, black oppression, and the road to liberation. Living conditions were pretty rough then, and I had to go and I'd gone back to my old trade of waiting tables in order to make some sort of a living. But I was restless, moody, and short-tempered, qualities ill-suited to the trade. Naturally, I had trouble holding a job. My trouble was not with the guests so much as my in immediate superiors, captains, head raiders, and dining car steward stewards, most of whom were white. In less than a month after Chicago of the Chicago riot, I lost my job on the Michigan Central as a result of a run-in with an inspector. The dining car inspectors were a particularly vicious breed. Their job was to see that discipline was maintained and service kept up to par. These inspectors, from whom were called company spies, would board the train unexpectedly anywhere along the route, hoping to catch a member of the crew violating some regulation or not giving what they considered proper service. They would then reprimand the guilty party personally, or if the offense was sufficiently serious, or turn him into the main office to be laid off or fired. Usually the inspector's word was law from which there were no appeal. The dining car crew had no unions in those days. This particular inspector, his name was McCormick, had taken a dislike to me. He had made it clear on other occasions. The feeling was mutual. Perhaps he sensed my independent attitude. He probably felt I was not sufficiently impressed by him and did not care about my job. He was right on both counts. He boarded the Chicago-bound train one morning in Detroit. We were serving breakfast. It was just one of those days when everything went wrong. People lined up at each end of the diner, waiting to be served. Service was slow. The gas was squawking, and I was in my me a mean mood myself. I was cutting bread in the pantry when McCormick peered in and shouted, Say, Hall, that silver is in terrible condition. The silver... What the hell is the man talking about dirty silver when I got all these people out here clamoring for their breakfast? I've been noticing you lately, he continued. It looks as though you don't want to work. If you don't, you like your job, why the hell don't you quit? I took it as a downright provocation. Damn you and your job, I exploded, advancing on him. He turned, he turned pale and ran out of the pantry. A friend of mine and the crew grabbed me by the waist. What the hell's the matter with you, Hall? Are you crazy? It was only then I realized I'd been talking to the bread knife. I've been waving the bread knife at the bread knife at the inspector. In a few minutes, the brakeman and the conductor came into the part pantry. McCormick brought up the rear. That's the one, he said, pointing at me. Addressing me, the conductor said, The inspector said you threatened him with a knife. Is that true? I denied it, stating I had been cutting bread when the argument had started and I had a knife in my hand. I wasn't threatening him with it. My friend, who had grabbed my wrist, sustained my story. 
Well, the conductor, you better get your things and ride to Chicago in the coach. We don't want any more trouble here. And the inspector has said he doesn't want you in the dining car. I went forward in the coach. I got off the train in Chicago at 63rd and Stony Island. I didn't go to the downtown station thinking that the cops might be wa waiting there. So much for my job with the Michigan Central. I went back to work sp sporadically in restaurants, hotels, and on trains. I didn't stay anywhere very long. The first job I re that I regarded as steady was the Illinois Athletic Club, where I remained for several months. I was beginning to settle down a little and participate in the social life of the community, attending dances, parties, and visiting cabarets. The Royal Gardens, a nightclub on 31st Street, was one of my favorite hangouts. King Oliver and Louis Armstrong were often featured there. At the Panama on 35th Street between State and Wabash, we went to see our favorite comedians, Butler, Beans, and Susie. It was on one of these occasions I met my first wife, Hazel. She belonged to Chicago's black social elite, such as it was. Her father had died and her family was on the downgrade. Her mother had was left with four children, three girls and a boy, of whom Hazel was the oldest. Other children, The other children were still teenagers, and Hazel and her mother supported them by doing domestic work and catering for wealthy whites. I was 21 and she was 25. Hazel was an attractive high school graduate. She spoke good English and, as mother said, had good manners. She worked for Montgomery Ward, then owned by the Philip philanthropic Rosenwald family, the first big company to hire blacks as office clerks. She had a nice singing voice and used to sing at parties. Her friends were among the black upper strata and the family belonged to the Episcopal Church on 38th and Wabash, which at that time was the church of the colored elite. We were married in 1920. I was all decked out in a rental sw swallowtail coat, stripped striped pants, spats, and a derby. The ceremony was impressive. Photos appeared in the Chicago Defender. In a short time, the romance wore off. Hazel's ambition to get ahead in the world, to be somebody, clashed with my love of freedom. I soon had visions, a quarter century hence, making mortgage payment on a fancy house, installments on furniture, trapped in a, and trapped in a drab and lower class existence surrounded by a large and quarrelsome family. The worst of it was having to be put up with being kicked around on the job and taking all the crap from head waiters and captains. I had been working at the athletic club for several months before I got married. Then nobody b had bothered me. When I asked for time off to get married, the head waiter and the captain seemed delighted. Sure, Hall, that's fine. Congratulations. Take a couple of weeks off. Upon my return, I immediately felt a change in their attitude. Now that I was married, they felt they had, they had me where they wanted me. They became more and more demanding. One day at lunch, I had some difficulty getting my orders out of the kitchen, and the guests were complaining. Not an unusual occurrence in any restaurant. Instead of helping me out and calming down the guests or seeing what the hang-up was in the kitchen, the captain started shouting at me in front of the guests. What's the matter with you, Hall? Why don't you bring, the, the, bring these people's orders? Can't you see that I'm tied up in the kitchen? Why don't you go out and see the ch chef instead of hollering at me? All puffed up, he yelled. Don't give me any of your lip or I'll snatch that badge off you. I jerked my badge off, threw the badge and the side towel into his face, and shouted, Take your badge and shove it. I was moving on him with a friend of mine, Jonathan, Johnson. A waiter at the next station jumped between us. I turned away, walked down the steps, through the kitchen, and into the dressing room. Johnson followed me into the dressing room a few minutes later. Hurry up and get out of here. They're calling the cops. I changed and left. My marriage went down the drain along with the job. That was a period of post. That was the, a period of post-war crisis. Jobs were hard to find, and especially for me, since I had been blacklisted from several places because of my temper. I was no longer the same man that Hazel married, and the truth of the matter is that I wanted it that way. Her hangups were of a typical black aspirant for social status, strivers we called them, who never really doubted the va validity of the prejudice from which they suffered. Hazel slavishly accepted white middle-class values. I, on the other hand, was looking around trying to figure out how best to maladjust. My Rebellion For me, the breakup of our marriage in the spring of 1920 destroyed my last ties with the old conventional way of life. 
I was completely disenchanted with the middle-class crowd into which Hazel was trying to draw me. But more important, I know I not only rejected the status quo, I was determined to do something about it, to make my rebellion count. I sought to answer a number of questions. What was the nature of the forces behind black subjugation? Who were its main benef be beneficiaries? Why was racism being entrenched in the North in this period? How did it differ from the South? Could the situation be altered? And, if so, what were the forces for change in the, in the program? I renewed my search for a way to go, pressed by a driving need for a worldview which provided a rational explanation of society and a clue to securing black freedom and dignity. My search was to continue during what my search was to continue during what must have been the most virulent and widespread racist campaign in U.S. history. The forces of racist bigotry unleashed during the riots of the Red Summer of 1919 were still on the march throughout through the 20s. Indeed, they had intensified and extended the campaign. The whole country seemed gripped in a frenzy of racist hate. Anti-black propaganda was carried in the press, in magazine articles, literature, and in theater. W.D. Griffith's obscene movie, The Birth of a Nation, was glorified the KKK, and depicted blacks as depraved animals was shown to millions. Thomas Dickinson's two novels, The Klansman, upon which Griffith's book picture is based, and The Leopard Spots, an earlier book on the theme of a white man's burden, were bestsellers. Racist demagogues of the stripe of Pitchfork, Ben Tillman of R South Carolina, Vardaman of Mississippi, and Cotton Ed Smith of South Carolina were in demand on northern lecture platforms. Closely behind the trumpet trumpeters of race hate rode their cavalry. A revived Ku Klux Klan now extended to the north and made its appearance in 27 states. The organization, embracing millions, headed, headed the list of a whole rash of super patriotic groups who were anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-foreign-born, and anti-black. The apostles of white Anglo-Saxon and Nordic supremacy included in their galaxy of ethnic outcasts, Asians, the Yellow Peril, Latin America, Latin Americans, and other foreign-born from Southern and Eastern Europe. The hate their hate propaganda pitted Protestants against Catholics, Christians against Jews, Native against foreign-born, and all the blacks upon whom were fixed the stigma of inherent and internal inferiority. It seems as though the prophets of the, law of the lost cause were out to reverse their military defeat at Appomattox by the cultural subversion of the North. They were, reviving, they were receiving encouragement by powerful Northern interests was self-evident. The Tin Pan Alley added its contribution to the attack with a spate of mammy songs upon, along the same vein. What, that's why the darkies were born. And that is a uh, excerpt of a song that I'm just not going to read out. A main objective of the racist assault was the academic establishment. The old, crude forms of racist propaganda proved inadequate in an age of advancing science. The hucksters of race hate conducted raids upon the sciences, especially upon the new disciplines, anthropology, ethnology, and psychology, in an attempt to establish a scientific foundation for the race myth. The new science of race evolved and flourished during the period. Spade work for, the gr for this grotesque growth had been done in the middle of the last century by, Fren by the Frenchman Count Arthur de Gobineau in his work, The Inequality of the Human Races, 1851-1853. to It was carried on by his, his dis disciple, the Englishman turned German, Houston Chamberlain, who asserted that racial mixture was a natural crime. In the U.S., early efforts in this field were the works of Knott and Glidden. There was also Ripley's races of mankind. Carrying on this pseudoscientific notion, tradition during the war and post-war years were the popular theorist Lathrop Stoddard, the rising tide of color against the white supremacy, against world 
against white world supremacy, 1923, and Madison Grant, The Passing of a Great Race, The Racial Bases of European History, 1916. The cornerstone of this pseudoscientific structure was social Darwinism, which was an attempt to subvert Darwin's theory of evolution and arbitrarily attempt to and arbitrarily apply natural selection in plant and animal society to human society. According to social Darwinists led by Herbert Spencer, the British sociologist, history was a continuous struggle for existence between races. In this struggle, the Nordic, Anglo-Saxon, or Aryan civilizations naturally survived as the fittest. The racists... The racists had a field day in history, the long area in which the heroes of the lost cause had their greatest, most effective concentration. They held chairs in some of the nation's most prestigious universities, Columbia, John Hopkins, Harvard, etc. Among such historians was William Archibald Dunning, who during his long tenure at Columbia miseducated generations of students and by his distortions of the Reconstruction, Civil War, and slave periods. In the academic world, this pseudoscience of racism held sway in only a few open challengers. The latter seemed to be in isolated voices in the wilderness, as the counteroffensive was slow in, in getting underway. In anthropology, there was Franz Boas's anti-racist thrust, The Mind of Primitive Man. This was written in 1911 and not widely known at the time. The works of his students and colleagues, most notably Mel Melville Hershowitz, The Myth of the Negro Pass, Jane Weltfish, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, and Otto Kleinberg, were not to appear until the next decade. In history, the movement for revision was then decades away. It only became a trend with the Black Revolt of the 60s. Black scholars had pioneered a re-examination. W.E.B. Du Bois, his Tour de Force, Black Reconstruction, and the epilogue, Propaganda of History, which contained a bitter indictment of the white historical establishment, was not to appear until the mid-30s. J.A. Rogers, popular black historian, had not yet appeared on the scene. Young Carter Woodson, who had who had founded his Association for the Study of Negro History in 1915, only began to publish the Journal of Negro History in 1916. His, only, his own important historical works were yet to come. Thus, from its tap roots in the southern plantation system, the anti-black virus had spread throughout the country, shaping the pattern of black-white relationships in the industrial and urban north as well. The dogma of, of the inherent inferiority of blacks had permeated the national consciousness to become the f an integral part of the American way of life. Racist dogma, first a rationale for chattel slavery and then plantation peonage, was now carried over to the North as a justification for a new system of de facto segregation. Black subjugation, city-style Jim Crow, became fixed by the 20s and continues up to the present day. Its components were the res residential segregation of the ghetto, with its inferior education, slums, and the second-class static status of black workers, and the labor force, where they were relegated to the bottom rung of the occupational ladder and prevented by discrimination from moving into better skills and higher-paying jobs. Although its purpose was not clear to me then, I later realized that the virulent racism of the period served to justify and bulwark the structure of black powerlessness which was developing in every northern city, where we had become a sizable portion of the workforce. At the time, the racist deluge simply revealed great gaps in my own education and knowledge, I knew that propaganda that the propaganda was a tissue of lies, but I felt the need for disproving them on the basis of scientific fact. I resisted racism, the lie of the existence in nature and superiority and inferiority of the races, and its con con concomitant fiction of intuitive hostility between the races. For example, a encounter to my own background of experience in Omaha. Religion as an explanation for the riddles of the universe I had rejected long before. I knew that our predicament was not the result of some divine disposition 
and therefore that racial oppression was neither a spiritual nor natural phenomenon. It was created by man, and therefore must be changed by man. How? Well, that was the question to be explored. I had only a smattering of knowledge of the natural and social sciences, much of which I had gathered through my readings of the lectures of Robert G. Ingersoll. It was through him I discovered Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution through natural selection. Armed with a dictionary and a prior knowledge gleaned from Ingersoll's popularizations, I was able to make my way through the origin of species. Darwin showed the origin of species to be a result of process of evolution, not the result of a mysterious, mysterious act of a divine creation. Here at last was the scientific refutation of a religious dogma. I had at last found a basis for my atheism, which had long been based mainly upon practical knowledge. Continuing my search, I found myself attracted to other social, social iconoclasts, uh, or image destroyers, and their, to their attacks upon established beliefs. I remember staying up all night reading Max Nordau's con Conventional Lies of Our Civilization, and being thrilled by his casti castigation of middle-class hypocrisy, prejudices, philistinism, and philistinism. Moving on to the contemporary scene, I discovered H. L. Men Menchkin, the stage of Baltimore and his smart set crowd. For a while, I was an avid reader of Mercury, which he helped to establish in 1920 as a forum for his views. I was particularly delighted by his critical foot pot shots at some of the most sacred cultural cows of what he called the American babbitry, bubocracy, anthropoid majority, Mencanian sorquets for a middle-class commoner. Menchkin enjoyed a brief popularity among young black radicals of the day who saw in his searing diatribes against WASP cultural icons, co idol, idols ammunition which, with which to blast the claims of white supremacists. The novelty soon wore off as it became clear that Menchkin's type of iconoclasm posed no real challenge to prevailing social structure. In fact, it was reactionary. He sought to replace destroyed idols with even more reactionary ones, as I soon found out. Menchkin's ph philosophical mentor was none other than the German philosopher Fred Friedrich Nietzsche, prophet of the, super of the superman of the aristocratic, aristocratic minority designed to rule over the unenlightened hordes of the Untermenschen, the primarily and inherently unequal majority of mankind. Most blacks then, including myself, who flirted with Menchkin, never accepted him fully. The one exception was George Schuler of the Pittsburgh Courier, Courier, who took Menchkin's snobbery and reactionary politics and made a career of them, which lasted for 40 years. What confused me most were the contentions of social Darwinists who claimed to be the authentic continuators of Darwin's theories. Darwin had not dealt with the question of race per se, but it seemed to me that his theory of evolution precluded the myth of race. How could Darwin's theory, which had helped me finally and irrevocably throw aside the veil of mysticism and put the understand me, understanding of the decent man within my grasp, how could this be used as an endorsement of racism? Perhaps, I'd been, had, perhaps I had been wrong. Was I reading into Darwin more than what he implied? It was my brother Otto who finally cleared, up, cleared me up on this point. He and I were running in different circles, but we would meet from time to time and exchange notes. Otto pointed out that social Darwinists distorted Darwin by me mechanically transferring the laws of existence among plants and animals to the field of social and human relations. Human society had its own laws, he asserted. Ah, and what were those laws? That was the subject that I wanted to explore. You ought to quit reading those bourgeois authors and start reading Marx and Engels, Otto told me, suggesting that I, suggesting also that I read Henry Lewis Morgan's Ancient Society and the works of Red Path. About this time, I got a job as a clerk at the Chicago Post Office. I heard that jobs were available and that veterans were given preference. Following the advice of friends, I approached S.L. Jackson of the Wabash Avenue YMCA, who at that time was a black Republican stalwart with connections in the Madden political machine. 
Jackson gave me a note to come to some post office if it come to some post office official in charge of employment. I passed the civil service examination in which veterans were given a ten percent advantage and was employed as a substitute clerk. The post office job in those days carried considerable prestige. It was almost the only cl clerical job open to blacks. Postal workers, along with waiters, Pullman porters, and tradesmen, were traditionally considered part of the black middle class. A number of prominent community leaders came from this group. Many officers of the Old Eight Illinois were postal employees, a good percentage of them mail carriers. The post office became a refuge for poor black students and the unemployed university graduates. For some of the latter, it was a sort of way station on the road to their professional careers. Others remained, setting, settling for regular post office careers. But even here, opportunities were limited. Blacks held only a few supervisory positions, as advancements were solely dependent on the discretionary of the white postmaster. On the job, I found work extremely boring. It consisted of standing before a case eight hours a night, sorting mail. All substitutes were relegated to the night shift. It took years to get on the day shift, which was preempted by the veteran employees. On the other hand, I found the company of my new young fellow workers very stimulating. In those days, or the organization of black postal employees was the Phalanx Forum. Before the war, the organization had played an important political and social role in the community. It was dominated by the conservative crowd of social climbers and political aspirants who were the most active group among postal employees and had close ties with local Republic the local Republican machine. Their leadership was completely ineffective with respect to the job. Job issues of black man rank and file employees had a little to no influence over the younger groups of new employees, which included many veterans and students. The gap between the old conservative crowd and the new youthful element was sharp. Among the latter was a radical sentiment uh, among the latter a radical sentiment was growing. I was immediately attracted to this group among whom I was I was to find friends who seemed to be impelled by the same motivations as myself to find new answers to the problems afflicting our people. Most of those of whom I fraternize with consider the postal job as a temporary as temporary a step to other careers. Our interest at the time, therefore, was not so much as with the immediate economic or, or on-the-job needs of the black postal workers, but with the race problem generally. The drive for the unionization of postal workers was to come later. The issue to which we were addressed ourselves was the current campaign of white racist propaganda, how to counter it on the basis of scientific truth. We saw a network of racist lies as clearly as clearly aimed at justifying black subjugation and destroying our dignity as people. On this question, we had a long, endless discussion on the job while sorting mail, at rest, during lunch breaks, and on Sundays when some of us would meet. I soon identified with what I considered the more vocal segment. Among a group of aspirant intellectuals, there was a medical student, a couple of law students, a dentist, whom we all called Doc, students of education, and some intellectually oriented workers like myself. On one Sunday when we had gathered, it was suggested, I think by Joe Mabley, that we organize ourselves as an inform informal discussion group, and that our purpose would be to answer the racist lies on the basis of scientific truth. The idea was instantly agreed upon. The discussion circle was loosely organized, not more than a dozen participants in all, all and bent on finding answers. The moving spirits of the group were John Heath, Joe Mabley, and Doc. Heath was a tall, light-complexioned man with high cheekbones. He was a graduate student in the field of education and a man whose sterling, and a man whose sterling character and keen intellect we all respected. Then there was Joe Mabley, a, bright, a brilliant small black man. He had large, velvety eyes and was a college dropout. He was married and had a family, two or three children, and had settled down to a regular post office job. He and Doc were the only regular postal workers in the group, the rest of us being substitutes. Doc had set up an office in the south side and was trying hard to build up a clientele while working night shifts. Originally, we had planned to meet every Sunday at noon, as the, was the most convenient time for the fellows on our shift. 
the meeting place were to alternate between the homes or apartments of the members. When we got to procedure, the group would choose a topic of discussion and ask for volunteers or assign a member to make introductory reports. He would then have a week to prepare the report. Our original plans included eventual organization of a forum in which the issues of the day could be debated and the holding of social affairs. All of this proved too, to be too ambitious. We found it impractical to have weekly meetings and finally agreed that twice a month was more feasible. The forum idea never got off the ground. Among us, I think we had most of the answers of the questions of race, that is, to all but the big lie, the one that was the most convincing to the white masses, and is the cornerstone on which the whole structure stood or fell, the assertion that blacks have no history. Of course, a leading formulator of the lie at the time was John Burgess, professor of political science at the history of, and of political science and history at Columbia University. The claim that there is nothing in the color of the skin from the point of view of political ethics is great sof sophism. A black skin means membership of a race of men who has never of itself succeeded in subjecting passion to reason has never therefore created any civilization of any kind. We wanted to refute the slander on the basis of scientific truth. For this we needed more ammunition and better weapons, particularly in the field of history. It was about this time that I met George Wells Parker, a brilliant young black graduate student from Omaha's Creighton University. I was introduced to him by my brother Otto, who he had known in Omaha. He was in Chicago to visit relatives and to conduct research for his dissertation. His major was history, I believe. We found him a virtual storehouse of knowledge on the race question, especially black history. His major objective in life was apparently to refute the prevalent racist lies and to build black dignity and pride. He possessed wide knowledge and seemed to have read everything. Parker called our attention to the writings of the great anthropologist Franz Boas the Egyptologist Virchow, to Max Mueller, philo philologist, and who formulated the Aryan myth and then rejected it, to the Frenchman John Finot, to, to Sir Harry Johnston, British authority on African history, and to Italian Giuseppe Serge and his theory of the, Medi in, of the Mediterranean races, a repudiation of the Aryan mythology. Proponents of the, this myth claimed all civilizations, Indian, Near East, Egyptians, as Aryan. One wonders why the Chinese were left out, but that would have been too palpable a fraud. It was Parker who called our attention to Herodotus, the Greek historian, who had described the Egyptians around his time, around 400 BC, as black and wo with woolly hair. Audra and I introduced Parker to our friends and acquaintances, and I, of course, to our discussion circle. He spoke before numerous groups. Everywhere was the hunger for his knowledge. We even brought him before the Bugs Club Forum in Washington Park, where he led a discussion on the race question. This brilliant young man returned to Omaha to resume his studies. The next winter he was dead. We heard it was the result of a mental breakdown. Thus was a brilliant career cut short, and potentially a, a great scholar lost. Surviving, I believe, it was only one brief paper and some notes. Garvey's Back to Africa Movement But time and tide did not stand still to wait for our answers to the social problems of the day, or for the result of our intellectual researches. While we sought arguments with to which to counter the racist thrust, the masses were forging their own weapons. Their growing resistance was finally to erupt on the political scene and the great, greatest mass movements of blacks since the Reconstruction era. Great masses of blacks found their answer in the Back to Africa program of the West Indian Marcus Garvey. Under his aegis, this movement was eventually diverted from the enemy at home into a utopian Zionistic channels of peaceful return to Africa and the establishment of, of a black state in the ancestral land. The organizational course of the movement was Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. He first launched this organization in Jamaica, British West Indies, in 1914. 
coming to the U.S., he founded its first section in New York City in 1917. The organization grew rapidly during the war and the immediate post-war period. At its height in the early 20s, it claimed its membership of half a million, where while estimates of the organization organization's membership vary from half a million to a million, it was the largest organization in the history of U.S. blacks. There could be no doubt that its influence extended to millions who identified wholly or partly with its programs. What in Garvey's programs attracted these masses? Garvey was an in, was a charismatic leader, and in that in that tradition best articulated the sentiments and yearnings of the masses of black people. In his UNIA, he also created the vehicle for the organization. More importantly, he was a master at understanding how to use pageantry, ritual, and ceremony to provide the ba black peasantry with psychological relief from the daily burdens of their oppression. His apparatus included a such high-sounding titles as Potenant, Supreme Deputy Pro Potenant, Knight of the Nile, Knight of the Distinguished Service, the Order of Ethiopia, the Dukes of Nigeria and Uganda. They were black gods and black angels in a black, black, red, and green flag. Black for the race, red for their blood, green for their hopes. The movement was fully outlined in the historic Declaration of Rights of the Negro Peoples in, of the World, adopted at the first convention of the organization in New York City, August 13, 1920. In the manner of the Nation of Islam, and its publication, Mohammed Speaks, by Lalian News, the program of Garvey combined realistic assessment of the conditions facing blacks with a fantasy and mystification about the solution. Along with the black Back to Africa slogan, the document contained a devastating indictment of the f plight of the black peoples of the United States. Expressing the militancy and of its delegates, it called for opposition to the inequality of wages between blacks and whites. It protested their exclusion from unions, the deprivation from land, taxation without representation, unjust military service, and Jim Crow laws. Anticipating the Black Power Revolt of the 60s, and documenting doc, doc, the document called for the complete control of our social institutions without the interference of any ra race or races. Reflecting the rising worldwide anti-colonial movement of the period, it called the self-determination of peoples and repudiated the loosely formed League of Nations, declaring its decision null and void as far as the blacks were concerned because it seeks to deprive them of their independence. This latter point was in reference to the assignment of mandates of two European powers over African territories wrested from the Germans. Through this atmosphere, atmosphere of militancy, ex expressing the desire of the masses to defect the, the defend the rights at home, ran the incongruent theme of, of back to Africa, declared Garvey. Being satisfied to drink the dregs of the cup of human progress will not demonstrate our fitness as a people to exist alongside others, but when, of our own initiative, we strike out to build industries, governments, and ultimately empires, then and only then will we as a race prove to our creator and to man in general that we are fit to survive and capable of sharpening, uh, shaping our own destiny. Wake up, Africa. Let us work towards w the one glorious end of a free, redeemed, and mighty nation. Let Africa be a bright star amongst the constellation of nations. Who are Garvey's followers? Garvey's Zionistic message was beamed mainly to the submerged black peasantry, especially its uprooted vanguard, the new migrants in such industrial centers as New York, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and St. Louis. These masses were made rank and file in the movement. They were embittered and disillusioned by the racist terror and unemployment, and sought in Garvey, saw in Garvey's very program of, of Back to Africa the fulfillment of their yearning for land and freedom to be guaranteed by a government of their own. On the other hand, Garveyism was the trend of a section of the ghetto, lower cl middle class, small businessmen, shopkeepers, property holders, 
who were pushed to the wall, ruined or threatened with by the ru- with ruins with ruin by the ravages of the post-war crisis. Also attracted to Garveyism were the frustrated and unemployed black intellect- intelligentsia, professionals, doctors, lawyers, with impoverished clientele, storefront preachers who had followed their flocks to the promised land of the north, and poverty-stricken students. Garveyism reflected the des- desperation of these strata before the ruthless encroachment of predatory white corporate interests upon their already meager markets. It reflected an attempt by them to escape from the sharpening racist oppression, the terror of the race riots, the lynchings, the economic and social frustrations. It was from these strata that the movement drew its leadership ca- cadres. The immediate pecuniary interests of the other of this element were expressed in the form of ghetto enterprises, the organization of a whole network of cooperative enterprises, including grocery grocery stores, laundries, restaurants, hotels, and printing presses. The most ambitious was the Black Star Steamship Line. Several ships were purchased and the trade relations were established with groups in the West Indies and Africa, including the Republic of Liberia. The New York City Division comprised a large segment of the immensely nationalistic West Indian migrant immigrants. West Indians were prominently prominent in this leadership in Garvey's close courtier and in the organization's inner councils. There could be no doubt of the considerable influence of this element of, on the organization. But the attempt on the part of some writers to brand the movement as a foreign import with no indigenous roots is superficial and without fo- foundation in fact. It is clear that Garveyism had both social and economic base in black society in the t- of the 20s. Nor was it Garvey's nationalism a new trend among blacks. Nationalist currents had repeatedly emerged, going back even before the Civil War. A key role in the movement was also played by deeply is- is- disillusioned black veterans who had fought for an illusory battle to make the world safe for democracy, only to return home to continue to make to continued and even harsher slavery. Veterans were involved in setting up the skeletal, skeleton army for the future African state, and in such paramilitary organizations as the Universal African Legion, the Universal Black Cross Nurses, and the African Motor Corps, and the Black Eagle Flying Corps. Many black radicals, even some socialistically inclined, were swept into Garvey's movement and attracted by its militancy. Despite this hostility toward local communists, Garvey seemed to regard this with the Soviet experience with some favor, at least in the early years of his movement. This probably reflected the sentiment of many of his followers. As late as 1924, in an editorial in the Negro World, he publicly mourned the passing of Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union, calling him probably the world's greatest man between 1917 and 1924. On that occasion, he sent a cable to Moscow, expressing sorrow and condolence of the 40... 400 million Negroes of the world. The the Garvey movement revealed the wide rift between the politics of the traditional upper class of the NAACP and the associates and associates and the life needs of the solely oppressed people. It represented a mass rejection of the policies and programs of this leadership, during which during the war had built up false hopes and now offered no tangible proposals for the meeting uh, the rampant anti-black violence and joblessness of the post-war period. The mood was expressed by Garvey, who denounced the whole upper-class leadership, claiming that they were motiv- motivated solely by the drive for assimilation and bl- banked their hopes for equality on the import support of whites, all classes of whom he contended were the black man's enemy. The pol- this policy of, le- of leadership, he maintained, was the policy of compromise. It was in these conditions that Garvey, as the sole spokesman for the new ghetto petty bourgeoisie, seized leadership upon the incipient black revolt and diverted it into, into the blind alley of utopian escapism. My contact with the movement was limited. I had never seen Garvey. I had missed his appearance in 1919 at the 8th Regiment Armory. I had never visited the organization's Liberty Hall headquarters. In Chicago, the movement seemed to spring up overnight. 
I first took serious notice of it in 1920. I listened to its orators on the street corners, watched its spe spectacular parades through the south side streets. The black, red, and green flags of the movement was carried at the head of the parade. The parades were lively and snappy, marching with where the black or the African Legion and the Universal Black Cross nurses in their spotless white uniforms and white veils. All marched in step with a band. It was quite impressive, but to me it seemed unreal and had little or no relevance to the actual problem that confronted blacks. From the first, Garvey's movement met heavy opposition in Chicago. The powerful Chicago Defender, edited by Robert S. Abbott, took the lead. If not the girl, world's greatest weekly, as its, as its masthead mast mast proclaimed, it had great influence among Chicago and South Southern blacks due to its role in promoting the migration to the North. It was widely read in the South where a daily newspaper of Athens, Georgia called it the greatest disturbing element that has yet entered Georgia. The defender was relentless in its attacks, throwing scorn and contempt on the movement and Garvey himself. In addition to the defender's attacks, the so-called Abyssia Affair in the summer of 1920 served to discredit the movement. The Star Order of Ethiopia and Ethiopian Missionaries to Abyssinia was an extremist split off from Chicago's UNIA branch. The leaders of this group held a parade on the rally of 35th in, Indian, in Indiana. Speakers clad in, in loud African costume called upon crowds to return to their African ancestral land. To show their scorn for the U.S., they burned an American flag, and then white policemen sought to intervene. The Abyssians shot and killed two white men and wounded a third. This incident was blown up in the white press as an armed rebellion of blacks. It was condemned on all sides in the, in the black community and by its leaders, including the editors of The Defender, who helped authorities in, it, in capturing the Abyssian dissidents. Despite its repudiation by the official Garvey organization, the Abyssian affair served to muddy Garvey's image in Chicago. I was working in the New York Central at the time and heard a graphic account of the affair from my aunts that when I arrived in town the next day. They lived right around the corner on Indian, Indiana Avenue. Despite the hostile black press and the Abyssian affair, the UNIA, the UNIA grew. At its height, it claimed Chicago membership of 9,000 9, devoted followers. This is probably exaggerated, but there is no doubt that, there, that the sympathies, sympathizers numbered in the tens of hundreds, tens of thousands. Our Sunday discussion group underestimated the significance of the Garvey movement, and the strength that was later rev to reveal was, re was later to reveal. We regarded it as a transient phenomenon. We applauded some of the cultural aspects of the movement, Garvey's emphasis on race, pride on on race pride dignity self-reliance his excoltiation of things black this was all th this was all to the good we felt however we rejected in its entirety the back to africa program as fantastic unreal and a dangerous diversion which would only lead to desertion for, of the struggle for our rights in the usa this was our country we strongly felt and blacks should not waive their claims to equality and justice in the land whose, to whose wealth and greatness we and our forefathers had made such contributions. Finally, we could not go along with Garvey's idea about inherent racial antagonisms between black and white. To this, this to us seemed equivalent to ceding the racist enemy one of his main po points. While it is true, and that I personally often wavered, in direction of race against race, I was not prepared to accept the idea accept the idea as a philosophy. It did not jibe with my experience with whites. While rejecting Garvey's program, our ideas for a viable alternative were still vague and, un and unformed. The most important the most important effect the Garvey movement had on us. was that it put into clear focus the questions which we sought to answer. Who were the enemies of the black freedom struggle? While Garvey claimed that, that the entirety of the white race was the enemy, it had not escaped us that he, this, he was inconsistent, being soft on white capitalists. His main target was clearly white labor and trade union movement. 
according to Garvey, it seems strange and a paradox, but the only convenient friend of the Negro, worker or laborer, has in America at the present time is the white capitalist. The capitalist being selfish, seeking only the largest profit of labor, is willing to glad willing glad to use Negro labor wherever possible, on a scale reasonably below the standard of the white union wage. But if the Negro unionizes himself to the level of the white worker, the choice and preference of employment is given to the white worker. If the Negro takes any advice, he will takes takes my advice, he will organize by himself and always keep his scale of wage a little lower than the whites until he is able to become through proper leadership his own employer. By doing so, he will keep the goodwill of the white employer and live a little longer under the present scheme of things. There's no doubt that Garvey was voicing the sentiments of the vast mass of new migrant workers, and it was not that we had any com compunction about strike-breaking in, in industries from which blacks were barred. In fact, that had always been one of the ways blacks broke into industries such as stockyards and steel. We were also keenly aware of the Jim Crow policies of the existing trade unions, trade union, trade union leadership, and of the anti-black prejudices rampant among white workers. But in casting blacks permanently into the role of stripe breakers, Garvey was helping to further divide an already polarized situation and playing into the hands of businessmen, bankers, factory owners, and the reactionary leadership of the trade unions. My own experience with the unions in the waiters' trade was bad. Old waiters would tell us how the first part of the century they had listened to the siren call of white union leaders. They had gone on, on strike, ostensibly to better their conditions, only to find their jobs immediately taken by whites. This had been quite a serious blow because at the time, black waiters had had jobs in most of the best hotels and in a number of fine restaurants. It is therefore unmistakable that in 1920, we, blacks waiter, we black waiters felt not the slightest pang of conscience in taking over the jobs of white waiters on the strike of Marigold Gardens, the old Bismarck Gardens, on the north side, and one of the swankiest night spots in Chicago. It was also probably the best waiter's job in town. In fact, so good that some of the German captains who remained on the job used to dra drive to and from to work in Cadillacs. The strike was broken after several months, and blacks were turned out. Strike-breaking to me was not a philosophy or principle as Garvey contended, but an expedient forced upon blacks by the Jim Crow policies of the bosses and the unions. Even if Garvey was putting forward such views, times we were beginning to change. A large number of blacks had been brought into industry during the war and had joined unions, especially in steel and packing houses. A new industrial unionism was developing and raising the slogan of black and white labor unity. My sister Eppa's experience in 1919 at Swift Packing Company were a case in point. She was one of the first black women to join the union during the organization dr organizing drive of the Stockyard Labor Council, which was headed by two communists, William Z. Foster and Jack Johnstone. The drive was supported by... John Fitzpatrick, chairman of the Chicago Federation of Labor, and a bitter foe of the Jim Crow machine of Samuel G uh, Gomper's AFL. Despite in inevitable racial tensions fostered by the employers, Epa had seen a basic unity of interest between all workers and felt strongly that the union was the best place to fight for the interest of black workers. In looking back at our study of the Garvey movement, it must be evaluated in the light of the fact that it was our first confrontation with national nationalism as a mass movement. Our mistake, which I find out later through my own experience and study of nationalist movement, resulted from the failure to understand the contradictory nature of nationalism of oppressed groups. This contradiction of, or dualism was inherent in the upper cla interclass character of these movements once they assume a popular mass form. They comprise various classes and social groupings, with conflicting interests and tendencies and motives, all gather under the unifying banner of national liberation, each with its own concept of that goal and how it should be attained. These conflicts, at first submerge, surface at the, as the movement, movement develops. They are expressed in two main currents, tendencies, within the movement. First of all, there is the nationalism which reflects 
the interests of the basic masses, workers and peasants, determined to fight for liberation against the oppressor of the nation. Then there is the nationalism of the black bourgeoisie, who, while at the time in conflict with the white oppressors, tend towards compromise and accommodation to protect their own weak position. From the very beginning of this dualism was reflected in the Garvey movement, the highly vocal and aggressive dominant professional and intellectual elements of for a black controlled economy. They sought fulfillment of this goal through withdrawal to Africa where they envisioned establishment of their own state, their right to exploit their own masses free from the overwhelming competition of dominant white capital. An historical example of this can be seen in Liberia. They thought they could accomplish this presumably with the acquiescence of the American white rulers and, e and even the active support of some. On the other hand, there was grassroots nationalism of the masses, the uprooted, dispossessed soil tillers of the South, and their poverty-ridden counterparts in the slum ghettos of, our, of the cities. These masses saw the black nationalist state fulfillment of their, of their age-old yearnings for land equality and freedom through, pow through power in their own hands to guarantee and to protect these freedoms. It was the indigenous indigenous, potentially revolutionary nationalism that Garvey diverted with his Back to Africa slogan. We fail to recognize the objective conflict and the interest between these classes, class components of the movement, equating the social and political aims of the ghetto nationalists, the bourgeoisie, that the masses, condemning the whole as reactionary, escapist, and utopian. These were the international, these were the internal contradictions upon which the movement was to flounder and finally collapse. They were brought to a head by the subsi subsiding of the past post-war economic depression, the uh, utter ushering of the boom and the subsequent easing of the fl plight of blacks, the partial adjustment of migrants to their new environment, and their partial absorption into industry. The main contradiction inherent in the Garvey movement from its early beginnings had been the conflict between the needs of the masses to defend and advance the rights in the USA and the fantastic back-to-Africa schemes of, Gar of the Garvey leadership. Garvey's emphasis on these fantastic schemes reflected his res resolution to the conflict in favor of business interests and against the interests of the masses. The resources of the and energy of the organization were increasingly diverted to support racial business racial business enterprises such as the Black Star Line and the Negro Factories Corporation. The concentration on selling stock for the Black Star, Black Star Steamship Line by the UNIA leadership from 1921 on neglected the immediate needs of the masses to begin and erode the base of support. Furthermore, Garvey's response to the crisis of the movement exposed the dangerous reactionary logic of the program based upon complete separation of the races and its acceptance of the white racist doctrine of natural racist racial incompatibility. Pursuing the logic of the idea against the backdrop of the organization's decline inevitably drove Garvey to alliance of expediency with the most rabid segregationists and race bigots of the period. Thus, in 1922, Garvey sought the support of Edward Young Clark, the imperial giant of the Ku Klux Klan. This meeting of the minds between Garvey and the Klan was not fortuitous. It was an open secret that it took place on the basis of Garvey's agreement to to soft pedal the struggle for equality in the U.S. in return for help to settle blacks in Africa. The ideological kinship arose from the mutual acceptance of the racist dogma of natural incompatibility of the races, racial purity, and so forth. In 1924, Garvey went so far, went so far seeking support for his Back to Africa program as to invite John Powell organizer for the Anglo-Saxon clubs and other prominent racists to speak at a UNIA headquarters. Garvey was also publicly praised the KKK. According to W.E.B. Du Bois, the Klan issued circulars defending Garvey and declared that the opposition to him was from the Catholic Church. In the late 30s, Senator Bilbo of Mississippi introduced a bill to deport 13 million bl blacks to Africa and received the support of the remnants of the Garvey organization. 
the final curtain was to drop on the Garvey episode with the failure of the Black Star Line. The movement was torn apart by factionalism and splits, with some of the leadership and, rem and remaining rank and file demanding that the domestic fight for equal rights be emphasized over the Back to Africa scheme of Garvey. The internal struggle drove many out of the organization and others and others into a multitude of splinter groups, each a variation of Garveyanism itself. Taking advantage of this disarray, the government moved in. In 1925, Garvey was framed on charges of using the mail to defraud in connection with the sale of stocks of the Black Star Line, and was sent to Atlanta Federal Prison for two years. He was deported to the West Indies upon release from prison. This debacle marked the end of Garveyanism as an important mass movement, although the offshoots continued to exist in numbers of smaller groups advocating Garvey's theory. At the time, I had taken Garvey's pe peculiar brand of representing nationalism in general, and had re simply rejected the whole ideology as a foreign import with no roots in the condition of U.S. blacks. Seeing only the negative feature of nationalism in the UNIA, I was blind to the progressive and potentially revolutionary aspects which would prove so important in my own later development. Thus, the great movement of Garvey built passed into history, but nationalism as a mass trend persisted in the black freedom struggle existing side by side with the assimilation trend. It was eclipsed by the latter in the so-called normal times, while flaring up in the times of stress and crisis. The Garvey movement was the U.S. counterpart of the vast upsurge of national and colonial liberation struggles, which swept the world during the war and post-war period. In this period, Masses of blacks had come together to consider themselves an oppressed nation. Garvey's ability to capture, capture leadership in this nationalist upsurge by default was the result of the immaturity of the revolutionary forces, black and white. The collapse of the Garvey movement proved conclusively to the petty bourgeois get a, getting nationalist current left to itself led only to a hopeless blind alley. Unfortunately, the forces which could give black nationalism revolutionary content, content and direction were only in the process of formation. The black working class and its spokesmen had not yet arrived on the scene as an independent force in the black community, and therefore were not capable of challenging either the assimilationist leadership of the NAACP or the ghetto nationalism of Garvey. Its counterparts among radical work class conscious white labor were waging an uphill fight against Jim Crow-minded AFL bureaucracy. Led by the Gompers machine, these radical sections of white labor were not yet clear as the significance of the black freedom struggle as a revolutionary force in its own right and regarded it simply as a part of the general labor question. Coalescence of these two forces was a, a decade away destined not to take place until the crisis of the 30s. The preceding analysis in, is hindsight. I didn't realize the significance of Garvey's movement until a few years later when I was a student in Moscow. I was assigned to the commission and prepare a resolution on the Negro question in the USA for the 6th Congress of the Communist International in 1928. It was in the course of this discussion that I came to recognize the nationalism as an authentic and potentially revolutionary trend in these movements. The assimilationist programs of the NAACP had been seen has been easy to reject. Garvey was somewhat more difficult. But while the Garvey movement was forcing me into consideration of nationalism, which at the time I also rejected, I could not help but notice the political developments of the period. Most, most conspicuous was the concerted and vicious attacks being carried out against white radicals and the trade union movement. And the same, the same forces appear to, be, to appear to be behind the Palmer raids of 1919 and 1920, behind the wave of racism, and behind a violent union strike busting which took place. The foreigners who were, be, who were being deported, the radicals who were imprisoned, and the workers throughout the country who were being attacked by the Pinkerton private armies were white as well as black, 
In Chicago, the strikes in the stockyards and street mill, street, st steel mills in the area particularly attracted my attention. For me, the Garvey movement, the racist assault, and the attacks on labor in the radical movement sharpened my political perceptions. The racial fog lifted from the face and location of the enemy it was clearly outlined. I began to see that the main beneficiary, beneficiaries of black subjugations also profited from the social oppression of poor whites, native, and foreign-born. The enemy was those who controlled and manipulated the levers of power. They were the super-rich, white, white moneyed interests who owned the nation's factories and banks and thus controlled its wealth. They were known by nature. They were known by many names, the corporate elite, the industrial, financial, and robber barons, etc. Chicago was home was the home base of a significant segment of the ruling class. Here in the chain of command was clear. On the political side, it extended from city hall down to the low, lowest hard wheeler and precinct captains. And city hall was, and was tied to all levels of with organized crimes. On the economic side. It was represented by such employer organizations as the Chicago Chamber of Commerce, by trade associations, and by top management in the giant industrial plants, railroads, big commercial establishments, banks, utilities, and insurance firms. Their chain of command extended down to the foremen and d department heads on the job supervisors. These levers of power also controlled education, the media, the arts, and all law enforcement agencies, both military and police. At the bottom of this pyramid, and bearing the weight, were the working people who toiled in the steel mills, the packing plants, the railroad yards, and the thousands of other sweatshops. Low, lowest among these were the blacks, pushed to the very bottom by the divide and rule policy of corporate giants and their henchmen, the, and their complementary Jim Crow policies and practices of the AFL trade union bureaucracy. Passages. Our postal discussion circle, which had held together scarcely three months, was breaking up. Heath, our chairman and recognized leader, was leaving. He had played the greatest role in keeping the group together. Now he had taken a job at some college in Virginia, his native state. Differences had already developed in the group, and with Heath gone, the possibilities for reconciling them was se seemed slim. These differences, I recall, were not of political or ideological nature. They were seldom expressed in the open, but were reflected in the opposition of some members to the proposals for enlarging the group and moving it to the outside political, into the outside political arena. This opposition evidently reflected the desire of some members to retain the group as a narrow discussion circle with the members restricted by the ta tacit peers, by the tacit understanding to those whom they considered their intellectual peers. It seemed to me that they sought to reduce it to, to a sort of elitist mutual admiration society. As a result of the sectarian attitude, the group hardly grew beyond its original membership of a dozen or so. There is no doubt, though, that our association had been mutually beneficial. All of us had grown in political understanding and awareness. But up to the time of Heath's departure, we had advanced no program for putting fo our newly acquired political understanding into practice. Our original plans for the organization of a forum to debate the issue of the day never got off the ground. We had not developed a program for involvement in the struggles of, our com of the community, nor for that matter in the immediate on-the-ground job problems of the black postal employees. We never even got around to deciding on a name for our group. One suggestion that we call ourselves the New Negro Forum was never acted upon. Heath, Mabley, Doc, and myself were beginning to feel the pull from the outside the need for the broad for a broader political arena of activity to play a more active role in the community we were the ones who most often attended radical forums and lectures and kept up, up and kept up crest of what was going on in the south, south side community we often went to the bugs local club in washington park chicago's equivalent of london's hyde park and the dill pickle club on north side which is run by the anarchist jack jones heath had gone Mar Mabley refused the chairmanship, pleading that he was tied down by his family and could not take on additional responsibilities. Doc refused to accept the honor, 
He was simply tied down by his job in dental practice. But the real reason for their, profu- for their refusal was that they were to confide to me later, was that they had lost confidence in the group. Without Keith, they saw no future role for it. Like myself, they were attracted to the broader movement. I also declined, giving my giving as my excuse that I was quitting the post office in a few days and going back to my old job on the railroad. A chairman pro tem was chosen. I don't remember who. I continued my reading along the lines which Otto had suggested. Among the books I had read were Henry Morgan's Ancient Society, which Engels used as the basis for the origins of family. Gustavus, Gustavus Meyer's History of the Great American Fortunes, John Reed's Ten Days That Shook the World, and Jack London's The Iron Heel. I also kept abreast of world events, reading about Lenin and Trotsky in, the revolution, in Revolutionary Russia. I followed the post-war colonial struggles, colonial rebellions of Sun Yat-sun's China, Gandhi in India, Ataturk in Turkey, the rebellion of the Rift tribes of Morocco led by Abdul Krim, these were the rumblings in black Africa, strikes and demonstrations against colonial oppression. One heard such names such as Kadeli and Gumade of South African National Congress and Sadino in Nicaragua who fought against the U.S. Marines for many years. My feet were getting itchy. I was fed up with the post, post office and the excruciating monotonous nature of the work. At the same time... At the same time, the night shift cramped my social life, as well as my growing need for broader political activity. I quit the job without regret. Soon after, I started work as a waiter on the Santa Fe's chief, the company's crack train running to Los Angeles. It was an eight-day run, three days to the coast, two-day layover in Los Angeles, and three days back. A crew would make three trips a month, a layover one trip, eight days in Chicago. This... This schedule gave me approximately 12 free days a month in Chicago, enough time for both political and social life. It was a hard job, but good money those days, and exciting after the drab routine at the post office. Los Angeles, sweet loves, as we used to call it. The Santa Fe boys, all big spenders, were very popular with the girls. A bevy would show up to meet us on the station every trip. I was to remain on that run for three years, which up to that time was the longest I had ever remained at one job. Upon my return from the first trip, I called Mabley and, for- and he informed me that he thought the discussion circle had dissolved. Only one or two guys showed up at the next scheduled meeting, and the pro tem chairman himself was absent. It was dead. My political development continued nevertheless. The runs on Santa Fe gave me ample time for discussion with my fellow crew members. Most of them, though somewhat older, were as rare as those at the post office with whom I had worked. I continued read to read, now studying the Communist Manifesto, Engels' Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, and Marx's Value, Price, and Profit. The first stage of my political search was near an end. In the years since I had mustered out of the army, I had come from being a disgruntled black ex-soldier to being a self-conscious revolutionary looking for an organization with which to make a revolution. For three years, I had listened in lecture halls, at rallies, in and in Washington Park to a spate of orators, each claiming to meet the challenges of the time. They included the great people's lawyer, Char- Clarence Darrow, Judge Fitcher of the Reform Movement, the socialist leader, Victor Berger, and sundry other members of his socialist of his party, the anarchist Ben Reichman, Ben Fletcher, the black IWW orator and organizer, and organized Garveyites. Although some of Although some had their points, for example, the fighting spirits and sincerity of the IWW impressed me, I rejected all of them. In the spring of 1922, I approached my brother Otto, who I knew had joined the Workers' Communist Party shortly after its inception in 1921. I told him that I wanted to join the party. The fact that Otto was in the party and had advised me from time on time on reading had undoubtedly influenced my decision. I had a generally favorable impression of the black communists I knew, men like Otto, the Owens brothers, and Edward Doughty. I was also impressed by whites like J- Jim Earl, Sam Hammerschmark, Robert Miner, and his wife, L- Lydia Gibson. What, he, what added great weight was my favorable impression of the communists, however, was their political identity with successful Bolshevik revolutions. At the, at the time it happened, I had been taken totally unaware of its significance. 
I had first heard of, heard of it during an incident that occurred in France in August 1918. My regiment, while marching into positions in the Sion sector, had paused for a rest. On one side of the road there was a high barbed wire fence. Upon it loitered groups of soldiers in strange uniforms. Upon closer observation, it became clear that they were prisoners. They spake a strange lang tongue, but we understood it from the gestures that they were asking for cigarettes. A number of us immediately responded, offering them some from our packs. When we asked who they were, one of them replied in halting English that they were Russian Cossacks. He explained that they had withdrawn from their lines, disarmed and placed in quarantine. They were considered unreliable, they said, because of the revolution in Russia. At the time, I was not even sure what the re meaning of the word revolution. Some kind of civil disorder, I conjectured. Giving the matter no further thought, we resumed our march. It was not until I returned to the front in France that I began reading about the Russian Revolution. From then on, I followed the course, and despite the distorted view from the U.S. press, its significance slowly dawned on me. Here, I felt, was a tangible accomplishment in real power. Along with the other black radicals, I was impressed, just as the, a later generation came to look at China, Cuba, and Vietnam as models of successful struggle against tyranny, colonialism, and oppression. Thus, I was particularly attracted to the communists. True, the party was largely white in its racial composition, with only a few handful, with only a handful of black members. I felt nonetheless that it comprised the best and most sincerely revolutionary and inter internationally minded elements among white radicals, and therefore formed the basis for the revolutionary unity of blacks and whites. This was so, I believed, because it was part of the world revolutionary movement uniting Chinese, African, Latin Americans with Europeans and North Americans through the Third Communist International. The Bolsheviks had destroyed the Tsarist rule, established the, workers, the first worker state, and breached the world system of capitalism over a territory comprising more than one-sixth of the Earth's surface. Most impressive as far as the blacks were concerned was that the revolution had laid the basis for solving the national and racial questions on the basis of complete freedom for the numerous nations, colonial peoples, and minorities formerly oppressed by the formerly oppressed by the Tsarist Empire. Moscow had now become the focus of the colonial revolution. In the turbulence of those days, there seemed every reason to think that the energy unleashed in Russia would carry the revolution throughout the world. In the U.S., the deluge of lies and distortions by the media, the red baiting, the Palmer raids, had not been able to hide this monumental achievement of the Russian Bolsheviks. The uniformed black men in the streets could not could reason that a phenomenon that evoked such fear and hatred on the part of the white supremacist rulers couldn't be all bad. As for me, the socialist victory confirmed my belief in the Bolshevik variety of socialism as a way out for U.S. blacks. I found theory behind this achievement, all there in Lenin's State and Revolution. He devoted and applied the theories of Marx and Engels on their role of the state in the dictatorship of the proletariat. This work was the single most important book I had ever read. I had read in the entirety of three years of my political search, and was decisive in leading me to the Communist Party. In this work, Lenin clarified the nature of the state and the means by which to overthrow it. His approach seemed practical and realistic. It was no longer just abstract theory. Using origins of the family as a departure point, Lenin demystified and desanctified the myth of the state in the capitalist society as an impartial monitor of human affairs. Rather, he exposed the state as in the capitalist society and its apparatus of military and police courts and pol prisons as an instrument of ruling class domination, a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. It thus followed that the job of forcibly replacing the state power of the dominant class with that of the proletariat was the paramount and indispensable task of the socialist revolution. As far as I could see, the Soviet example appeared to be to offer completely clear solution to the problem facing American workers, both black and white. I saw the elimination of racism and the achievement of equality of complete equality for blacks as an inevitable byproduct of the socialist revolution in the United States. It was in this moment that I became fully resolved to make my own personal to make my own personal commitment to the fight for the socialist United States. The first part of my odyssey was over. Thanks to everyone who tuned in for this episode of the Book Club Commune. Next week, we'll be getting into Chapter 4, An Organization of Revolutionaries.
again, thank you everyone who's listening. Please share this with people who you think need to read Black Bolshevik or just know have been trying to find a way to read it but have been unable to source a copy or need an audiobook. I want this to I want this to be available to as many people as possible. Until next time, solidarity and keep on reading.